All right, uh, my name is Marshall, and I'll be talking about our experience at Dumballa using Clojure to find botnets. And I will get my slides working. Oh, maybe, maybe one day. One of these buttons. How do computers work? Okay, that worked. Um, so I've been thinking a lot recently about what makes a language practical. And there's a lot of like, intrinsic and extrinsic aspects of a language which can make it practical. But this kind of necessary subset is that the language is productive. And by productive, I'm speaking specifically about getting things to production. So taking something from an idea like the soft and building software that can turn that idea all the way through into something that delivers value at appropriate scale with appropriate maintenance costs for whatever length of time you need this piece of software to do the thing it's supposed to do. So we found Clojure to be an incredibly productive language. And for some very specific applications, uh, for these specific set of reasons, um, being JVM hosted, highly interactive, and value oriented. So other languages have one or sometimes two of these, but Clojure is fairly unique in having all three of these to an incredibly deep level. And we found that the combination of these three things working together results in something that is far more productive than the contribution of each one individually. So Dumballa, uh, you probably haven't heard of us. Uh, but what we do is we make a appliance, a network appliance, like a physical box, that sits in customers' networks and monitors their network traffic. What we're looking for is signs of malware activity on individual computers in their network. When we see malware active, when it's communicating up to its command and control servers or doing something else malware does, we let them know. The customers, not the malware. So at Dumballa, on the R&D team, we love Clojure. Uh, we've been using it for about four years now. Uh, there isn't that much closure like, in the appliance itself, but it's used extensively and almost exclusively on our back-end server infrastructure. Uh, we use it for our malware analysis pipeline and for like, integrating microservices. But there's one place in particular where we've been using it uh, for the longest, and that's in data analysis problems. And that's where uh, this kind of triforce of properties like, really comes in and really uh, uh, what's the term, like, like uh, makes Clojure the most productive environment that I'm aware of. So this was an alternative title for the slide. Uh, Bobby kind of prefigured my uh, joke here a little bit, but the, uh, we can call Clojure the practical submersible submersible factory for your data lake. And if you haven't heard this term data lake, I know I heard some people laughing when it was mentioned earlier, but here's the wiki, uh, the wiktionary definition. So a massive, easily accessible data repository for storing big data designed to retain all attributes, especially so when you do not yet know what the scope of data or its use will be. Like, this is my favorite buzzword, because it's so funny. Um, like, here's my uh, attempt at an honest definition. So it's a Hadoop file system filled with messy, semi-structured data that no one's figured out what to do with, but you've got to keep it, so you just shove it all in HGFS. So when someone says that they have a data lake architecture, they're kind of admitting that you know, they have a data architecture in the same way that a small child cleans their room by just shoving everything in the closet. <laughs> yeah. So at Dumballa, we have a data lake architecture. So uh, we've got all these like, random data sets that have weird names that were created you know, with uh, random ad hoc data formats for specific projects that no longer exist. But it's data that is potentially useful. And we keep it, and I think that actually we can justify it. And you probably, if you're doing this, can probably justify it too, if your core business follows this kind of pipeline. What we need to do, ultimately, is predict the presence of malware on customers' networks. So that means we need to figure out how to transition from raw data to meaningfully predictive features, and then translate those features into predictions about the presence of malware. And then that first part, like this, this kind of process from data to features, like that's the hard part. And that's the part where you don't want to throw anything away that might potentially end up being predictive. This part's easy. Like this part, like if this part were the hard part, then I, I would argue that everyone would be programming in J and not in Java. Like in J, like you can write an algorithm, like in the entire thing, like in the length of code it takes you to make a joke about how verbose Java is, right? But the, the point, 
is that the hard part, the part that you need to iterate on and the part that you need to actually like, uh, need your language to support being productive in is having this iteration of getting from your raw data to things that are actually have predictive value. So kind of my, my takeaway here is that when we have this sort of problem where we need to start with something that's uh, like an unknown uh, predictive value data and turn it into something where we can actually get new information out of it, is that we prefer having real programs over simple queries, right? We want the power of a full programming language, uh, which, you know, here, so we prefer a closure filter to simple where clauses. So back to this. So I'm going to contextualize this by talking about a specific project that I've spent a lot of time on recently at Dumbala uh, that I named Penumbra. So what Penumbra does is that we attempt to classify computers based upon their aggregate DNS behavior, so the collection of domains that they resolve, not simply individual signals. Uh, the best example of this, that, or the easy example of this, is talking about click fraud malware. Uh, so click fraud malware will get commands of sets of uh, sites to generate traffic against, and these will be updated periodically. And these are sites that humans don't visit very often, but a human might visit one individually. But if we see a computer visiting a whole bunch, we can be pretty confident that that's actually malware and not a human just randomly visiting one of these websites. So in order to do that, we need to apply that process I was showing earlier. And that's where the properties that I was just talking about start to come into play. So I mostly want to talk about their combination, but this one, JVM hostedness, is so important on its own, I'm gonna call it out. So the data that we have, this, that we're pumping into our data lake, uh, you know, it's not the biggest data, but we're getting about half a terabyte a day. And then of that data, about a quarter terabyte a day is the data set that I'm using for this project, where we have data sharing arrangements with our ISP customers and get anonymized passive DNS data. Now, a quarter terabyte is not huge, but if you want to do tempo cross temporal analysis where you're looking at a couple weeks at a time, it gets pretty big. And to handle that, you're, you're kind of going to have to use Hadoop. Like, there just really isn't any other publicly available solution that allows you to have heterogeneous jobs running in a, uh, you know, ad hoc fashion on that scale of data. And Hadoop, of course, is a JVM platform tool. So that means you need a JVM language to interoperate with it well. Um, now, that's only partially true, right? Obviously, the Spark people have put a ton of work into making Python work well with Spark, but they had to put a ton of work into it. Um, by just having a JVM language to start with, then you get to part of making actual, uh, um, you know, adding business value far more efficiently. And then we're not just using Hadoop, right? So here's this like, logo of projects that are involved in Penumbra. Um, we're using Avro for data. We're doing some initial analysis using Hyperlog log implementation from Streamlib. Uh, we're using some tiny bits of Mahout, not any of the machine learning. And then uh, we're using the Liblinear port of Java, uh, um, sorry, the Java port of Liblinear to uh, uh, build the models for each individual malware campaign. And what's fascinating about this, um, in my opinion, and the way that, that Clojure implements its JVM hostedness is that these are the libraries where we have significant integration wrappers, right? So for Avro, we um, have the Abracad library, which allows us to directly pr produce closure data from Avro data, and that's highly useful. Uh, for Hadoop, we, we use Parkour, but then there's lots of other libraries out there um, that lets us you know, write our closure code and then have it run very directly as Hadoop jobs. But for all the other stuff on this slide, like, you, you don't need those details, right? You can just call the Java API. And that is incredibly powerful. Like, opens up the range of options you have in your ecosystem incredibly. So, uh, so kind of my takeaway here is that you should prefer integrating to wrapping. Like, that's been our experience. Um, the time we don't spend writing superficial wrapper libraries is time that we can spend instead having a better understanding of the uh, libraries that we are using and applying them to the problems we actually want to solve. Okay. So the next important thing is then starting to look at these intersections. So the intersection of JVM hostedness and interactivity. So the key place this comes into play in the kind of applications I was talking about and, and in the development of Penumbra is in asking the question, what does my data actually look like? Right? Um, 
Like even if you're using a system with schemas, like we are with Avro, um, you still end up like you might stare at the Avro schema and be like, oh, okay, well, what does that mean when I've got this union of these three types and then I can allow a string here and you know. You, you just don't have a clear picture, or, or rather you can have an even clearer picture than you could have otherwise by getting to look at the data and actually pulling it into your REPL where you can see it. Um, so this is an example using parkour distributed sequences, but you, you can do the same thing with, with Spark or any of the other libraries or any database, in fact, that you're using, right? You've got your data and then you can pull it into your REPL and you can see what it looks like because you are writing this application that runs in the JVM that will use whatever data access method you'll use. Your REPL is just another JVM application. You're just putting them in the same JVM. No problems. Just pull it in, see what your data actually looks like. So this gives you the confidence that when you're writing applications, like you, you kind of have this idea that you know, your data will be what you expect it to be. Uh, so the takeaway from here is uh, you know, don't you know, try to avoid doing things that uh, prevent you from integrating data sources with the REPL. Um, we had some experiences with some earlier libraries before we wrote Parkour, um, and the Spark case uh, enclosure still seems to be a little bit of this, where you know, there'll be disclaimers like, this doesn't work in the REPL. Um, and I, that's not necessary, and it impedes this development. So I think the, uh, yeah, the takeaway here is to think about this case and you know, make sure that data can just be pulled right into the REPL. So the second part is the combination of the REPL interactivity and the value-oriented philosophy. Now, by value orientation here, this, this, this part, this one's gonna be the, like, the like, kind of obvious one for most people in the closure community. Uh, but the value-oriented part, we tend to write our functions, or we tend to try our programs in terms of pure functions operating on immutable values. So when we're talking about this pipeline, like this is where we pulled the data into the REPL, but now we want to iterate. We want to try to find these actually predictive features. So we're transforming our data. And even if we know what it looks like initially, like what does it look like after we transform it? Well, with the REPL, we have this very obvious way where we can actually just try these transformations out and see what the result is. And then because we're working with pure functions on immutable values, we can hoist what we've done in the REPL put it in a function, and then it does, still does the same thing, right? So that gives us confidence that we know that when we perform a transformation on data that we know what it looks like, we know what the result will be. And that lets us iterate on this process of figuring out our predictive, um, predictive features far more quickly. So the takeaway here is that we prefer values to state, right? And this one is, again, this is the gimme. This is obvious in the closure community. But you know, there's certainly ways that state can sneak in. Uh, some of our early experience with, uh, with Clojure, you know, we did crazy things with dynamic uh, variables, and you still see it occasionally with libraries that interact with databases where there'll be some like, global piece of state that needs to be uh, you know, properly configured. I think Component has uh, cleaned a lot of that up, but um, you know, anything that impedes this ability to have transforms right in the REPL um, slows down this process. Um, and you know, is easily avoided. All right, so uh, the last part is when we can take the value orientation, these pure functions, and combine them with the hostedness of the JVM. So the place where this comes nearest to my heart is uh, transformations that we want to run in a MapReduce fashion. So MapReduce is, is actually pretty straightforward to understand. Um, you know, if I'm sure, how many people have been doing MapReduce a lot? MapReduce, okay, so actually a fair number, so this, this uh, won't be completely necessary. But the basic idea is that we, uh, we have an operation, we have some transformation, and we want to split it, or what, all we need to do to make it work with MapReduce is kind of split it into two operations. One where we previously just had, we're transforming our square into a circle, now we transform a square into a circle, but then we also have to have another operation that takes some arbitrary number of circles and produces another circle. So then all we do for MapReduce is we run a whole bunch of the first operation in parallel, and then we run another set of the operations uh, with all those output circles. So this is pretty straightforward. The problem, like, like I think almost all of the complexity comes in when you start looking at it from the, the kingdom of nouns, Java object-oriented perspective where then these are what your operations look like. And oh, my slides are getting cut off on the side. Oh. Um, so you end up with this, uh, 
like collection of like, like templates where it's like all the transformation is bolted together with like the mechanism, right? So that you have this like intermingling of parallelism and it's a map reduce and what are my types and it's just kind of all glommed together. So in closure, we can focus on the transformations, right? We can just have pure functions operating on values and then have those operate in the JVM cleanly. Now, systems like Spark, you know, put the pure functions in the forefront, but then they almost have the opposite problem, where if you're working with Spark with, part, with, um, with Python or with Scala, you know, you'll have this uh, pure functions here where you can only use pure functions. And like if you read the Spark uh, introductory documentation, you know, they make very certain to call out like, hey, be careful, like if you try to have this mutable object sitting off here and then you've got this pure function, like it's not gonna work, you know, because your job is gonna be distributed and all this code will be running on the cluster. And with, with closure, if everything is already written as pure functions, you don't even need to think about that. Stuff just works, right? You wouldn't even, uh, think to be writing this mut mutability in terms of an object in the first place. So the takeaway here is prefer interfaces that work in terms of functions and not interface or interfaces that require things that aren't functions. Uh, Michael Dragonis made the same uh, point with Onyx, but I think it applies to a wide variety of data processing applications. Um, as, you know, especially if you're integrating with a JVM system which uh, you know, in its underlying Java implementation or Scala implementation, like wants something that's an object that embraces mutability, instead of like having some way of like having a def random thing that you bolt into that, like find a way where you can feed a pure function in and have the pure function do all the work. And the result will work in the REPL and will also be a far cleaner, more closure-ish experience. All right, so I've kind of zipped through my slides, so. Uh, um, my conclu in conclusion, uh, so this is the, the triforce of things that makes Clojure an incredibly productive language for data processing applications. Um, and the lessons that we can kind of take away from the experience we've had at Clojure, or uh, the experience with Clojure that we've had at Dumbala, is that uh, we want to uh, you know, work on APIs and interfaces that support these properties and the interaction between them. So we prefer things that work in the REPL to things that require ahead of time compilation. We prefer values to state. And uh, we prefer things that are functions to things that aren't functions. So that is that. Uh, any questions?